Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Achieving Zero Trust with Zero Fuss. Today's event is brought to you by Illumio and produced by Actual Tech Media. Now, before we get started, we have a little bit of housekeeping we first need to cover. First off, we want this to be a very educational event. We want you to learn a lot about zero trust and micro-segmentation, and because of that, we encourage questions throughout the event. Just use the GoToWebinar questions box right there, and we'll be answering those questions throughout the event. We also encourage you to learn more about this topic by using the handouts that are available to you right there in the GoToWebinar console. They are the definitive guide to micro-segmentation and an Illumio solutions brief on how to achieve zero trust. So make sure that you check those PDFs out. Just click on them and they will automatically download for you and you can read them after the event. And then before I introduce our presenter, I want to point out that we do have a $300 gift card that we'll be giving away on today's event to one lucky attendee. I'm sorry if you're watching this event on demand, that drawing has already occurred. The full prize terms and conditions can be found at events.actualtechmedia.com. And without further delay, I'm excited to introduce today's presenter. That is Katie Wood, Senior Product Marketing Manager at Illumio. Katie, take it away. Thanks so much. Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. We're going to talk about how and why to achieve zero trust. It's possible, and it can be simpler and more cost-effective than you think. We'll kick off today with why zero trust is important now, then we'll drill down into exactly what we mean by zero trust and how you can achieve it with a technology called security segmentation. We'll touch on some of the challenges of traditional methods for this in today's environments and how to have a successful deployment before finally outlining a typical implementation with Illumio. So what's driving zero trust? Why is this important now? Well, Forrester introduced zero trust nearly a decade ago. It's a concept focused on number one, the need to challenge and eliminate the inherent trust assumptions in our security strategies that have made us vulnerable to external and internal attacks. And number two, segmenting and securing the network across locations and hosting models. The upshot of this is that zero trust is really all in the name. Not only do you require authorization for folks entering your network from the outside, but you do not automatically trust anyone already inside the network. Whether it's an internal or an external user or process, they require prior authorization to access anything. Zero Trust really shifts security from an outside-in exercise focused on securing the perimeter to an inside-out focus that encompasses everything. Part two here is that in order to secure both the firewall with granularity, uh, you need the ability to segment and restrict your applications across environments with consistency. And it requires this across locations and hosting models, a principle that has become much more important as our environments now frequently extend outside our own networks. Why has Zero Trust come to the fore? Well, in the last few years, our IT environments have been changing a lot. The pace of technology is accelerating to keep up with the need for speed in the business, and that means more complexity and more diversity to our environments. Applications are dynamic. We see in the first figure, we've got containers and the move to a DevOps motion with the disintegration of monolithic apps into microservices with the ease with which you can spin up and spin down workloads in public clouds, essentially ephemeral workloads. This picture is a lot more dynamic. Uh, with all this change, we still have our existing infrastructure, meaning we're increasingly heterogeneous, bare metal, virtualization, containers. Workloads are distributed globally across data centers. And lastly, throw in hybrid and multi-cloud for good measure. We're all familiar with rapid cloud adoption, IDG predicted in 2018 that IT environments are moving from nearly half cloud in 2018, last year, to more than two thirds by 2020 next year. And a lot of that's gonna be public cloud. So as our environments have gotten more dynamic and complex, we also face greater security threats and need to govern all of these different environments consistently. Our environments have grown outside the data center and our own networks, yet we're still relying on traditional perimeter security tied to the network. For a more contemporary security posture, we need our security to run anywhere on anything. We need it to agility. Many people have moved to a DevOps model to push applications out faster and traditional security can't keep up. We have a much expanded attack surface due to the cloud and more of our environments being outside of our own data centers and networks. And this means not just at the perimeter. We live in an age where we must assume breach. It's a fact of life for business and governments that attacks will happen and the perimeter can be breached. The question is, how can you adequately protect your applications behind the firewall inside the perimeter and to prevent attackers from moving between applications from low value assets to high value assets as they go? As it turns out, this is not just a theoretical question for those of us in the industry. Uh, more regulators have taken note of the fallout from breaches at the industry and even the global level. 
They're now giving directives on how to secure data to prevent the spread of breaches and assigning fines as a punitive financial sting to people who don't comply. Zero trust is often adopted as a best practice by folks who failed a penetration test and need to work on segmenting their SWIFT or PCI environment, for example, uh, to prepare for an audit and defending their defenses to regulators. Newer regulations like SWIFT or GDPR mandate compliance with standards for protecting the critical data and preparing for breaches by arming your network. Here we see some other additional regulations aimed at consumer privacy, national security, and protection of industries like finance or critical infrastructure. The penalties here range from the risk of being excluded from industry standard systems, uh, in the case of SWIFT for banking uh, payments and messaging, or in the case of GDPR, fines calculated by revenue with a cap of 4% of annual turnover or annual revenue. So compliance is also a giant driver of zero trust adoption is the upshot. But all of this comes at a price, right? The bottom line is that we don't have unlimited security budgets to combat this. Um, I probably didn't need to put this headline here for a lot of us to understand that security spending is massive and there's a lot of pressure to keep costs down. It's the, the air we breathe, right? But Zero Trust can help with this as well. As you see on the right, Zero Trust has been gaining traction because it gives us a defensible framework to reduce our risk exposure by 37% or more, according to Forrester, and it can significantly reduce your security costs by a third as well. Sounds good, right? Well, let's take a look at what Zero Trust is and how we can deploy it for better security. So as we establish, Zero Trust has two basic principles. We need to challenge and eliminate the inherent trust assumptions in our security strategies that made us vulnerable to external and internal attacks. And number two, we need to segment and secure the network across locations and hosting models. So what are the basic tenets of this? Well, Instead of having a perimeter focused outside in view of security, we need to assume breach. As we say, there are companies who've been breached and companies who don't know or haven't disclosed that they've been breached. We have to assume that a breach can occur and has occurred. Number two, uh, outside and inside don't matter anymore. Someone in the network should not be trusted any more than someone outside the network. Least privilege, we're familiar with the age old security maxim, there needs to be a legitimate business need for anyone to access anything. Always verify, you need the capability to understand identity and limit access to granular security parameters. Default deny, you are guilty until proven innocent. Finally, whitelisting, you must be proactively authorized in order to access. If your name is not on the list, then the doorman will not let you in. It's also useful to think about what zero trust is not. How is this a change from what we're accustomed to? So instead of allowing access unless it's specifically forbidden inside the network, we have a default deny posture based on whitelisting. Instead of having no insight into our environments, we need a high degree of visibility across everything in order to understand the environments, inform the policymaking, and ensure that they're being enforced consistently, rather than having, you know, maybe five disparate uh, environments that we don't really have any visibility into and have to govern separately. On that note, instead of having multiple disjointed solutions to administer separately and inconsistently, we need consistent security across workloads wherever they run. Instead of perimeter-only firewall defense, we need microperimeters to isolate our data and applications according to business logic. And lastly, it needs to work in practice. It can't be a theoretical exercise. Um, it can't be a mountain-moving failure when it comes to deployment. It has to be possible, not just in theory. So what's the end goal to zero trust and how do we make it possible in practice? The objective here is to expand security from the perimeter and what we call north-south traffic in and out of the network to also include east-west traffic within the infrastructure. And the way we do that is through micro perimeters, sometimes called micro segmentation or other times called security segmentation. So what is security segmentation? Let's take a look at how the technology works to prevent the spread of breaches. If you think of your network as one of these submarines, the one on the left has a very strong perimeter, but no segmentation inside to separate the different parts of the craft in case of the breach. If it's damaged by a torpedo, the whole thing goes down. If it's carrying ammunition that explodes internally, the entire craft could sink. By comparison, the one on the right can potentially take on damage in any one portion without compromising the rest of the craft. Its attack surface for any given breach is greatly reduced. If it is breached, whether internally or externally, only one compartment is damaged and there's a greater likelihood that it will survive intact. Another way to think about it for those of you who travel a lot is like your hotel room. Most hotels now have security in their elevators. You limit which floor you can go to. You have a key for your, for your room and that key also will unlock the floor for the club and the floor for the pool. They figure out your identity and then control the access that way. But what if security was only at the street level front door at the perimeter and that security did not follow you into the building. Once you were inside, you could enter any floor, any room, access any safe. 
This is really the risk you're taking with the network without security segmentation. There's nothing to limit the spread of breaches through lateral movement. Back to our definition in an enterprise environment, uh, security segmentation is a method of isolating and segmenting processes, workloads, applications, or entire environments in order to, number one, control any communications in and out of the segment, and number two, contain, contain the attack surface in the area of compromise in case of breach, or in our metaphor with the submarines, reduce the attack surface in the blast radius. In our case, access works through something called whitelisting that we mentioned previously, or policy that only gives access to approved entities and denies anybody who's not approved, which is usually a much longer list. This default deny posture is aligned with NIST recommendations on access as well as zero trust frameworks. And the gist of it is that you just don't consider anyone trusted automatically, whether they originate inside or, inside or outside your network. You don't want to give access to anyone unless it's formally authorized. You specify who should have access. This posture also aligns with uh, least privilege. Again, people or workloads should only have access to systems where there's a legitimate business purpose. So why does security segmentation matter? Well, here we see a representation of a breach in recent memory, the target breach. Hackers went in through an HVAC vendor's portal to target with legitimate credentials. And because of vulnerabilities in that application, were able to move later laterally through the network until they reached the point of sale system, which you see on the right here. Personal information for 70 million customers was compromised. And in fact, we see this pattern over and over again. Another example is the Bangladeshi bank heist, which led to tighter regulation around ring fencing SWIFT applications for the banking industry. It turns out that the common denominator to many of these major breaches is lateral movement or east-west traffic. These threat actors access a seemingly low value system like the HVAC portal and then spread laterally through a network that they now have free access to until they get to something of higher value like the point of sale system. And at that point, they can cause varying levels of damage, loss, theft, or exfiltration of IP. 2018 breach numbers you see here, they're very common. Uh, and the average dwell time in 2018 for an infiltrator on your network was 78 days. Imagine what someone can find within 78 days of surveillance. That's nearly an entire business quarter of being in your network and developing a 30, 60, 90 plan for targeting your key assets. We see this pattern over and over again. And so the question is, once a threat actor has gained access to your network via some, via some low value asset, what is stopping that lateral movement? What do you have in place to disrupt it? And this is really where security segmentation comes in. Last point I wanted to make here about security segmentation is again, the bottom line. Segmentation can reduce your exposure to the spread of breaches and prevent exfiltration of mission critical data. It can also reduce your costs. These figures are 2018 averages from the Poneman Institute on the cost of breach to a business. As you can see from this chart, the global average cost of a breach is around 3.86 million US dollars. In the US it's double that, nearly $8 million. But the other finding from Poneman's research was around how to reduce these costs. Companies in their survey that identified and contained a breach quickly saved more than a million dollars. So if we think about this in the context of segmentation, ring fencing your high value assets really makes identifying and containing a breach irrelevant. It doesn't just have to be quick because even if your network is breached, your most valuable assets, assets are already secured. If someone goes in through your HVAC portal, they will not be able to get to your point of sale system because they won't be able to see it to access it. They don't even need to know it exists. So let's talk a little bit about different approaches to segmentation and how to do this effectively. Typical approaches to security segmentation fall into two buckets, traditional network-based segmentation and software-defined networking or SDN-based segmentation. Both of these approaches have some inherent limitations that make segmentation more difficult. They have multiple administration points, policy tied to IP addresses, applications that are often not conveniently located in network boundaries, um, and inconsistent segmentation capabilities across different devices and environments that make the strategy complicated. I mentioned we have seen environments where there are five separate segmentation solutions which cannot be governed consistently. These limitations and approach result in some unintended consequences. Uh, number one, increased risk of network or applications failing due to inaccurate policies. Number two, uh, increased network fragility because it's hard to manage. Number three, lower agility due to a fear of failure. And I would just point out that businesses are, do not really find any of these acceptable. So we need to sort of re-examine the foundations here. Why is this so fundamentally difficult? Well, sec security segmentation is hard because networking and segmentation desire opposite outcomes. We build networks so they are fast, resilient, and flexible. The IP protocol was designed to offer seamless connectivity, even in the face of multiple network outages. 
When we use the network to segment, we work against its natural tendencies and have to build inspection and enforcement points into the data path. The more control we want, the more intrusions we must create. If we think of our network like a highway, the segmentation on it is kind of like a toll booth. Some of you may be old enough to remember what those are. We used to have to stop and manually give a toll booth operator our cash, creating huge bottlenecks. And if you wanted to expand and, and collect more money, all you could really do is create more toll booths. It slowed down everything. This is until they invented EasyPass, which has an RFID chip that could seamlessly pay your toll from the privacy of your car, barely slowing you down. Basically, they decoupled the tolls from the infrastructure of a toll booth and a highway, letting you sail through toll plazas without creating enormous cho choke points on the highway. Just as we decoupled toll collection from the highway infrastructure, we must decouple segmentation from the network architecture. Networks are designed for resiliency, for performance, essentially connecting things. Security segmentation is all about isolating things, keeping people out. These two objectives are in direct conflict with each other. In fact, some of our customers have told us they were forced to break their network to implement security segmentation on the network, taking something that was working and breaking it in order to protect it better. At that point, you might as well just set your money on fire. But what if you could decouple security segmentation from network architecture, making it a non-issue? Well, you can. Let's talk about how. So what is needed to decouple? Let's start architecturally. First, you need to get beyond IP addresses. You need a way to group and label logical bunches of things to organize them. Secondly, you need a map to see what is talking to what. You need to understand how applications are communicating within themselves and what's talking to them. Third, you need a way of drafting, testing, and enforcing policy. This gives you a way of defining and managing your segmentation safely. Let's uh, drill down into each of these just a little bit. So to get beyond IP addresses and working with just kind of numbers that are more machine readable, we need a way to group and label logical bunches of things. Basically, we need to organize these endpoints into logical groups assigned based on business decisions using a richer context than an IP address, a schema to serve as a business logic extrapolation layer. You need a way to create labels for hosts by roles, applications, environments like test dev prod that you might want to separate and location as well. And the good news is that all of this metadata is already, it already exists in systems of record like your CMDB, Active Directory, hostname conventions, IP address management systems, etc. So it's already there. Secondly, our customers tell us you can't protect what you can't see. What you need for visibility is a map. And a map is critical for two reasons. One, you see what's talking to what within applications and uh, outside how applications talk to each other. And two, it gives you a shared view of the truth. Um, everybody can have a common vision operationally that they work off of, singing off the same hymn book, as we used to say. A map gives you the critical capability of being able to collaborate on how to secure or change things with all of your stakeholders. You can collaborate with the application owners, with ops, with the network and security teams. You can validate application configuration and function. You're able to obtain quick agreement on impact of proposed changes. And finally, it makes it easier for audit and compliance teams to approve segmentation policy, which is often the point of the whole exercise. So lastly here, you need a way of drafting, testing, and enforcing policy. This gives you a way of defining and managing your segmentation safely. I can define segmentation for a specific workload, for instance, and then test it without risking any breakage. Compare this to traditional risky ways of implementing new segmentation and kind of crossing your fingers that no applications are blocked. It's a very real risk and one that's never acceptable to the business. Once applications and systems can be identified by a label, it becomes possible to anchor security policy to each of those labels without consideration for where it might reside on the network. Here you see different types of segmentation you can do with it, environmental, application, tier, or process. This means that policy is can all be implemented without any network impact at all. Our customers tell us this approach is faster, easier, and less expensive. You don't have to re-architect your network. It's also less risky in that you will not break the network or impact your business as usual. Sounds good, huh? Well, how does it work? Well, at Illumia, we've built two pieces of software to make this decoupled model work. The first is a small agent that we call a virtual enforcement node or VEN. But it isn't like any security agent you're familiar with. It's not in line to traffic. You don't have to recompile a kernel module. There's no heavy CPU load from processing application packets. The VEN is very small in size because it has a simple job. It provides application level telemetry and forwards it to the central brain. 
What's it doing? The then decouples visibility from network sources and enhances visibility down to the process level within monitored systems. The second part of our solution is the Policy Compute Engine, or PCE. It takes the decoupled visibility data from the VEN and the label assignment and creates application dependency maps. The Policy Compute Engine also provides a simple interface with automation that helps build, model, and test the security policy. When you're ready, that policy can be pushed down to enforcement points that are already decoupled from the network. Now, we've already said that our agent is not in line to traffic and can't directly block anything. So what happens next? How do we enforce? Well, the VEN receives the segmentation instructions and inserts them into the level three firewalls, level four firewalls. And these are in every modern operating system. Uh, on Windows, it's the Windows filtering platform. On Linux, it's IP tables. And there are equivalent capabilities in AIX and Solaris. So you're using the native enforcement points that already exist. In this way, we can decouple security policy from the network. Number one, visibility is decoupled and extended via the VEN. Labels decouple applications and servers from the network, and the application dependency maps tie it all together into a clean workflow. Finally, the existing OS level firewalls decouple segmentation enforcement from the network. So this then creates a virtuous cycle. Any change to a workload changes the telemetry going back to the policy compute engine. It can compare these changes to the security policy and recalculate the correct rules, then push them down to the workload firewalls. In this way, security is dynamic, automated, and constantly up to date. Because the policy computing engine is API driven and the policy is label based, it's easy to automate segmentation policy using common automatic automation frameworks too. That means security segmentation can keep up with DevOps workflows. So that's great, but how does it work in practice? How difficult is this to deploy? Well, real quick as an overview, the first step is to identify and map data flows in order to have the visibility to design them. You need to be able to see who is legitimately talking to the applications in order to create policies that won't break existing applications. At this point, uh, we hear from clients, you may discover a lot of unknown unknowns uh, if you haven't added visibility through your network previously, but it's a critical first step. Next, you can design and test your policy prior to enforcement. Again, the goals are to have secure policies that allow what needs to happen and restricts what shouldn't happen without breaking anything when it comes to enforcement. Finally, step three here, you have enforcement itself. I would just add here that you want a system with audit ready capabilities so you're able to communicate and offer evidence to your stakeholders that you do have an always on kind of evergreen protection because being able to defend your approach is an important benefit of following zero trust principles. You have to be able to show, don't tell, right? From an enforcement state here in step four, you can further use the segmentation to map vulnerabilities between applications. Uh, this is used to lower risk and prioritize patching. If you have an application with vulnerabilities that cannot be patched, you can still mitigate some risk by at least shutting down any unnecessary connections. Finally, automate and orchestrate. Your future state here is to have adaptive policy that's orchestrated automatically. This can be integrated with your SIM systems to provide audit worthy documentation of enforcement as we mentioned, and eventually it can become a fairly low touch intuitive system. Uh, our customers often are able to outsource maintenance because of the high usability if they can outsource maintenance, uh, they still enjoy the high usability. They tell us they like being able to, when there's a notification, just go in, visually see where there are issues from the map, and then fix the policy in real time in test mode before they enforce it so they're sure that nothing breaks, just business as usual. So to tie this off, let's just underscore some of the elements for a successful segmentation strategy. Full visibility, because you can't protect what you can't see. Policy modeling, to avoid breaking applications and enforcement. Customizable granularity. You wanna make sure your policies can extend to any business or compliance requirements and be consistent across environments. Dynamic adaptation, because manual efforts are doomed to fail, especially in the cloud. Quantifiable risk. Are you audit ready and able to defend your efforts numerically with how many vulnerabilities you've prevented? Reporting. Are you able to have a real-time account of your policy management so that auditing will not be a point in time exercise every time there's a client or regulatory request? Can you show your work? You want to think about not just the environments and requirements you have today, but how these will change and what you might need to future-proof your needs. And that's really it. Thanks so much for your time today. I hope it's been helpful and ignited your enthusiasm for Zero Trust. Great presentation, Katie. Really, really insightful here, uh, what you all are doing with Zero Trust to make that possible. We do have some questions here for you from the audience. The first one I see that came in here, they're asking about, uh, is segmentation the only thing that I need to do to uh, implement zero trust? 
That's a great question. If only it were that easy. Uh, segmentation is a critical enabler of zero trust, but there are a number of other technologies involved to enable it as well. If you think about uh, identity and access management, for instance, you need a way to prove the identity of somebody before you can decide whether to authorize them. Uh, an app that will authenticate your fingerprint or ping your phone and make you confirm or ask you questions about your addresses over the last 10 years, I've seen some of those. Those are required to figure out if you are who you are before you can be authorized through the whitelisting. So that's just one example, but segmentation is a, is a really critical component of zero trust and it's often the hardest nut to crack in terms of making it work. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Next question here. They're interested in compliance and, and regulations and they're asking, uh, you know, if they adopt zero trust, is that enough to make them compliant with most of the regulations out there? Uh, I mean, zero trust is a great foundation and a way to kind of agree on what you're going to do with your stakeholders internally and then defend it externally to uh, third parties. But it's important to clarify that zero trust is a best practice framework it's not a direct mapping to regulatory requirements. So it's important to have those audited separately. It's more the case that enterprises often find that they need to segment for the purpose of a regulation like Swift or PCI. Um, maybe they failed a pen test before an audit. And so they need to isolate this particular system in their environment. And because segmentation can be fairly comprehensive, you need to know everything that Swift and PCI environments are talking to you anyway. They say to themselves, well, why aren't we doing this everywhere? Which is a good question. And the beauty of a solution like Illumio is really, number one, you can do it everywhere if you want to. Number two, it's really not as onerous as you might think. And three, you can also do it strategically in a phased approach without having to break everything in order to protect it. So you can start with low hanging fruit around your regulatory requirements, do an assessment of what else will give you the biggest return on your investment, what are the most high value assets, and then roll it out organically to suit your needs. So you've got options. Excellent. Excellent. Well, it looks like that's all the time we have for our live questions. But uh, last question I want to make sure I ask you is, what should someone do if they want to get started with the Illumio solution? Is there an easy way to, to try it out for themselves? Well, one thing that we recommend, uh, if you really don't know where to start, a good thing to do is just kind of get a benchmark. Um, if you want to know more about your current posture and what to do, um, we have the Illumio attack surface quiz. It's only five multiple choice questions. It gives you an estimate of your attack surface a benchmark for others in your industry based on uh, survey data that we did in our research, and then some free recommendations of what you can do to improve it with or without software. You don't have to spend a dime. I really encourage you to check it out. It's a lot of fun. Uh, if you're ready to try it out and get your hands dirty, uh, you can map your application dependencies to understand your own environment better with the free trial. You install the agent and it shows you exactly what your application dependencies are. Uh, it'll let you view those maps for 30 days, model security policies, and learn how microsegmentation can prevent the spread of breaches in your own environment. It's really a great way to visualize things for yourself um, and also for your stakeholders. Visibility is really key, kind of this principle I keep reiterating of show, don't tell. It can help your stakeholders have a common vision and gain alignment on what you need to do. And like we keep saying, you really can't protect what you can't see. So check it out. It's a lot of fun. Absolutely. Yeah. And one of the things I know I love about the Illumio solution is it's all software. So it makes it super easy to get started and, and do a free 30 day trial like this. Um, I'll make sure that I put the two links that you just showed on the screen there in the chat for the audience so that they can easily click on those links and, and give it a try for themselves. Uh, Katie, this has been a really educational, really informative webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.